Well, we we probably probably should fucking do something. Do we play V Prime after last? Uh, a little bit. Nothing. Um, nothing crazy, but um, definitely a little bit lethargic. Yeah. Let's see. I'd stick for just the one episode a week for now. I'll do. I'll do one today for sure. Yep. And then. I'll make sure we fucking turn these off. There were some really good quotes on this one too. This this was great. Um, I'll wet my throat. I know it's blasphemous. I don't have fucking liquid death this week. But I've been busy, so get over it. For all the tens of individuals that care, maybe not. Um, I had a I had a really good spurt of creative inspiration and most of it has been around the subject of really really going all in on something and i I think the the majority problem that most people have today is that they pussyfoot around and they go halfway 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 and there's a mathematical construct that talks about this called an asymptote and it always approximates uh so if you think of like a a spiral going in. It always gets closer and closer and closer and closer and closer, but it never actually touches itself. And so you never actually get there. And and the Alan Watts concept related to this is that if you are always looking forwards for the thing that's going to generate you happiness or a feeling of success or a feeling of fulfillment or anything like that, you're always going to be living where you're not. And you're always going to be perpetuating that into the future. So the asymptote concept is that you're always going to be close to it getting there but you'll never actually arrive and this is common in most people's vernacular today as well you'll ask you'll ask somebody how they're doing and you're like oh yeah i'm getting there or i'm i'm close or whatever the fuck that is even meant to mean like the, the only place that you could possibly be where you are being asked that question is right where you are now and the more that you reconcile that and collapse the issues of, of thinking about the future which causes anxiety and, and judging yourself of the past which causes depression the more that you reconcile that and that the only thing that you could possibly do is the thing that you're currently doing right now so if you're choosing to think about the future of shit that hasn't happened yet you're probably going to foster some level of anxiety if you're choosing to think about the past and all of the indiscretions that you've committed you're probably going to lead down the path of depression or sadness or whatever else. But the whole point of it is, is that you're choosing to be where you are not currently. And I've gained a lot from reconciling both of those things. I was, when I was in my 16s and 17s and probably all the way up into my 20s, I would constantly think of how good my future was going to be. Uh, or how good it could be and then having an anxiety-based response as a result of not actually being there. But the thing that you're promoting energetically and unfortunately for most people, they don't ever figure out this uh, equation. What you're promoting energetically is that A, you have a lack comparative to this thing, which means you're always going to in a way, manifest the distance between it. You're actually focusing on the distance rather than the achievement. And B, you're fostering an anxiety nature as a result to that. So you're always going to be in this nervous, uh, unbalanced sort of energy when you're thinking about these things. So let's say that you have a typical young male's mind where you're thinking about becoming ultimately competent, confident, capable in one specific area so that you can afford yourself all the niceties, whether it be a watch or a car or a house or uh, telling your parents they can retire and and doing all these nice things that most of us think about on a day-to-day basis. If you think about that as I am getting there or it would be nice or uh, one day, it's always going to be there. It will always exist one day. One day doesn't exist because there's only now. Uh, If you're getting there, you'll be perpetuating the idea that you are getting there. So you'll always be on the drive on the way, but you'll never actually be there. So the little hack between this is to think about it in a way that you've already achieved it. And what would that make you feel? How would you feel if you were actually already there? 
had you already arrived, what would you be feeling? And that way you can sort of collapse it because you're thinking of how you would be feeling in that moment, but you're also dragging that into a feeling state that you have in this moment. The reason that that's so important is because you're not putting it at a distance away from you and you're also not allowing it to cultivate any sort of anxious nature. And this is what I define as going all in because you're not saying it'll come eventually, it'll come tomorrow, maybe one day, any of those sorts of things. You're actually reconciling your your thoughts, your actions and your words so that you are giving yourself the opportunity to say, it will do what you say and say what you do. You're, you're putting all of these tasks into one bucket. And I've been going over some thematic learning structures and the underpinnings of how we can learn faster with themes and uh, how we can stack habits and, and put things all into these nice neat little boxes. And one of the fascinating things about that is that once you decide to go all in in this way where your thoughts and your words and your actions, they all align, you can start to reverse engineer a process of what it would be like had you already achieved X, Y, Z, and then build that into a lifestyle where you actually live your way through it day by day. You're not putting it out there to say that it's a specific habit or a specific behavior, but it's more putting yourself in the mind of the individual that has already done what you want to do and then living in a very similar fashion to what they would do. So let's use an example. Let's use the example of a professional athlete where you're not one and you would like to be one. The way that you look at it, you're like, all right, well, how would I feel day to day if I was a professional athlete? I would feel that I wasn't waiting on motivation to act because I know that they train every single day no matter what. I would be extremely focused on the goals that I'd set myself forward. So I'd probably have some process orientation around uh, articulating my goals to myself, refreshing them in the mind, keeping them focused. I would probably feel that uh, I had a very good stronghold on my ability and capacity to recover so that I wouldn't feel fatigued. I wouldn't feel sloppy. I wouldn't feel uh, rushed in any sense because I would have already pre-planned what my day has to look like so that I could facilitate the best gains of the training that I'm going to do. And you start to go down this list and you write out these things and you look at the page and you go, all right, well, that's how I am to act if I align all of these things into one nice, neat little basket. If you act the way that you would feel, at least in your own representation of the idea, long enough, you will eventually become that person and there's no, there's no variance in that idea. If you wanted to become financially independent, for instance, and you're like, well, what would that feel like? Well, well I, would, I would have a certain level of security when I looked at the accounts that I store all my money in. How would I get to that stage? And you reverse engineer it and you go, would I spend more than I earn? Probably not. And then you start to delineate these habits. You start to think about these daily tasks. And you think, all right, well, I would, if I was to do that, I'd probably have to set a daily budget and that daily budget would be complicit within a weekly budget and then a monthly and then a bi-yearly or bi-annual uh, and then a yearly and then I could extrapolate that if I really wanted to. And if I was really about it with numbers, I could extrapolate that out to decades and think about uh, the interest that I could accumulate on the investments that I'm doing and da 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 It's very simple. This, this is what it means to go all in. And it's not just the visualization aspect of this. It's not just the thought process of this. It's the actual generation of the idea and then the absolute relentless violent action after the idea has set within itself. And I, I've been through this with, um, I've, I've been through this with many different subjects. Jiu Jitsu is the, the most um, obvious one for me to recall because I'm currently in it right now. And for a long period of time, I was doing it because I enjoyed it and I thought it was fun. And then I competed and then I competed again. And then I immediately switched the tune where I was like, nah, I'm, I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna go all in on this. And that has meant varying degrees uh, of things, even, even to myself, as I continually expand my perspective and my viewpoint of what that really means. And obviously, you need the context to make those decisions, but you have to go through it to get the context. So there's no way of really cheating the game. You're going to learn things that are absolutely and utterly integral to the decisions that you make at a later stage only by going through those intermediary stages. 
So what I thought was going all in was showing up to every single training session, three days a week, five days a week, eight days a week, uh, eight times a week, 11 times a week, and then 13 times a week, and now 15 times a week. I thought that just showing up would be enough to, to facilitate um, the, the very high level of, of skill attainment that I would like. But now I understand it in a revolutionary way where I'm thinking about not only how I'm showing up, but what am I actually actively trying to achieve within a session that also fits within a week, that also fits within a month, that also fits within the context of the competitions that lay themselves out throughout the year and why that's important, how I'm facilitating that based on recovery patterns and based on other things that I want to juggle within my life because jiu-jitsu is not the only thing that exists at one time. It has to be complicit within social relationships and business and family and all these other things that are important to, to most people. And that is constantly and, and uh, always ever-changing. It, it's perpetual in its nature that it, it continually grows and evolves and augments and it, it's completely malleable within your hands. I did a pottery class the other week, which was really fucking fun. I recommend you go do it. But you could see that just by turning your thumbs ever so slightly, the, the bowl or the cup or the vase or whatever you were making would completely change shapes. And that's pretty much how I think about these things on a day-to-day -day basis. You're going to learn new things as long as you're on the journey, on the path, on the wheel. You're going to continually learn things that force you to change your perspective. You're going to continually learn things that allow you to gather new context to make better decisions. And I think it's really important that you take a conscious awareness around this specific element of the learning process because you'll start to learn that there's concurrent themes within this learning process you'll start to see your own cognitive biases where you think that you're all in, but you're not. And that's part of the fun game because there's always gonna be somebody that is a, a much higher level learner than you are. And they've considered more operational things than you have. And maybe they're willing to work a little bit harder. Maybe they're willing to forego um, some niceties more than, more than you are. And you can always learn from this and then continually put that into your own version of, of how you're doing things. So it's a really cool moving target, I guess, in a way. This is very akin to a, a Matt McConaughey speech that he made. I think it was like the Golden Globes or the Emmy. I don't even fucking know. Anyway, the, the speech was that he was asked by a family member of his who his hero was. And he said, well, I don't know. I'm going to have to get back to you on that. And I'll, I'll come back with an answer tomorrow. So he woke up the next day and they had the conversation again. He goes, did you find out who your hero was? And he said, yeah, it's me. But in 10 years, when I'm 30. And he goes, oh, okay, cool. That's that's a cool idea. And he comes back to him when he's 30. He goes, oh, well, are you your hero yet? And he goes, no, nah, no fucking way. My hero is me when I'm 40 in another 10 years. And he tells a story a couple of times where they go back and forth with each other. And the whole idea is that if you, if you always have this overarching theme and this target that you're working towards, there's just going to continually be new developments on it every single day, every single week, every single month. And this will always catapult you into different contexts and different learning um, habits and behaviors and things you pick up along the way, things you discard along the way as well. Uh, it's very important to consider the unlearning process at the same time. We come into things with a lot of preconceived notions and ideas that it has to be done this specific way or I'm this type of person so I have to do it this way and all of these other uh, miraculous cognitive biases that we that we come up with and most of them are untrue. The gross majority of them are actually untrue and we don't really, uh, Hormozzi says that his favorite quote, I forget the guy that says it, but he goes, um, we, we never think to question the beliefs that we hold as actual beliefs because we believe them. And it's easy to get wrapped up in that because if you think that it should be a certain type of way and you just never think to question it, then you'll always be underneath the guise of those uh, rosy colored glasses that you're looking through. So getting to a stage where you legitimately go all in is first this process of what would it feel like if I'd actually achieved it? But then at the second stage, it's being willfully capable to accept that it's not set and forget. You, you don't just get to say, I want to be financially independent. I want to have the best physique ever. I want to be a world champion. You don't just get to say that. You can if you want to, but everyone's going to think you're a fucking idiot. You don't just get to say it. You, you get to say it 
but then there's an unwritten entanglement underneath it that says, I will commit to this every single day, not even until it happens, because that's a result-based thinking mindset. And, and in my opinion, it's the wrong way to go about things. It should be process-oriented. But the way that you set this goal is you, you see yourself had already done it, and then you commit to the actions of that person or what you think that person would have done to achieve it. And then you learn every single day along the way until you get there. And you're never going to know how it's going to happen. That's completely out of the question to know how. And this this is kind of like as a side point why I completely disagree with um, uh, deterministic simulation theory because there's no possible way that you can account for all the variables of all the humans, of all the people on earth. Even tracing one human with all the variables that they go through in their entire life would be mathematically impossible. Times that by eight and a half billion and it's a completely unrealistic number that I don't even know exists. So you're never going to know how it's going to work which is the challenge that 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 begets the biggest part of the challenge because there are going to be days where you look and you go fuck me again like i i put more effort towards it and i got no steps closer you'll hit the pillow at night going i don't know if this is going to work and you'll have doubts and fears and insecurities and you'll think to yourself well I didn't have all these doubts and fears and insecurities at my job that I had or when I was uh, doing something else with my life or when I was just running into the fold or I just fitting in with everybody else. I didn't have these. So maybe I should go back to that land and go and exist over there for a bit because I'd be able to at least get rid of the fears and the doubts and the insecurities. But that's a fundamental mistake because the fears, the doubts and the insecurities, the only things that allow for the opposite sides of those coins. The competence, the achievement, the the glory, the greatness, they're all complicit. Like people often objectify onto high level athletes. Uh, Let's say like Mike Tyson, for instance, he's been very vocal on this particular subject. They often inflect upon the athlete and say, that guy is fearless. He trains like he's fearless. He competes like he's fearless. It's categorically untrue. They feel the same fear that you and I do. Except for him specifically, he had a phenomenal psychological mentor called Custy Amato. And he was very avid in his destruction of fear being an enemy. He was poignant in pointing out to Mike Tyson. He goes, there's two people in regards to fear. There are champions and there are cowards. Cowards run away from it champions harness it into their own energy and then project it onto their opponent and mike tyson talks about this he's very famous for doing so talking about how terrified he is all the way through training camp all the way up until the day of the fight the press conferences everything and you see that in the later stage of his career after he went to jail where he is lashing out a lot more he's a lot more volatile And I think that's representative or symptomatic of the fact that he was feeling quite fearful. And usually when a dog barks back or bites or anything like that, it's because they're scared. It's not because they're aggressive. Anyway, so he talks about this and he he goes through the story and he goes, I'm fucking terrified when they're like wrapping my hands up. I'm nervous. Uh, when When they're putting the gloves on, I'm fucking just, I don't want to be there. But then the music starts pumping. My walkout tune starts going. I start walking to the ring. Like I'm, I'm getting less nervous. Like I, I feel like I'm unshackling these chains off me. And he gets into the ring. The whole way up, he's just thinking to himself, "Fuck it, it's, it's, it's going to go away. It's going to go away. It's going." When he gets there, he goes, "I'm getting more confident, more confident, more confident, more confident." He goes, "When I step in the ring, I feel like God." And he goes, "As soon as I lock my eyes on my opponent, they're fucking done, finished, done, completely, completely finished." And you look at his highlights and you watch him make those walks to the ring and you can see it visually if you know what you're looking for. As soon as he gets into the ring, he fucking locks eyes like a homing missile and this poor cunt across the ring is just going, why the fuck did I sign up to this? Which is why, why? So it's, it's, not a, it's not a reality of them negating these feelings. It's not a reality of them existing outside of these feelings. They're not these miraculous guru type fellas from eastern philosophies where they don't feel a thing uh i think it's uh there's the pratyeka buddha and then there's the bodhisattva 
in um, Eastern philosophy. Pratyeka means like stone Buddha where they attempt to just isolate themselves from everything and basically live in what is misappropriated as the meditative state where your mind is completely empty. Uh, the, the mistranslation on that from a Western perspective is that you're meant to be thinking about nothing. It's actually not the case. Um, if you've ever endeavored down the path of meditation, you know how difficult it is under that pre-context because this is how I used to think about it. I used to think that it was the emptying of the mind and complete segregation from all thought. And then you go, all right, that's the goal. I'm going to go sit down now. I'm going to go, pre- I'm going to go practice it. So you sit down, you practice and you go, pretty fucking hungry i wonder what i'm gonna have for lunch do i have cheese in the fridge nah i probably have to go to woolworths and get that then you you think about it and you're like oh i'm gonna drive there it's raining i probably need to take an umbrella if i take an umbrella i'm gonna have to put somewhere to put it and then when i get into the shops i'm gonna have to find the aisle and you go fuck 10 minutes has gone past and i was like just reliving my entire fucking thing that i haven't even done yet and then you deem that as a failure because you're like well i was meant to be thinking about nothing when in actuality, it's not the absence of thought, it's the absence of attachment to those thoughts so that whatever you're doing, you get fully with it. So whether you're thinking about dragons and fucking mystical shit or you're thinking about your to-do list, it's the soul pointed focus and complete and utter focus and attention to whatever you are doing at that time. So let's say an easy example is like you follow your breath. And then you go on that Woolworths journey where you think about the cheese that you need to buy for the sandwich you're going to eat because you're hungry and your lunch and whatever. The game is actually getting back to your predetermined focus being the, the breathing that you're going through. So you're always returning. Every time you return, you win. And that this is the misappropriation is that people think they've spent 15 minutes failing. But even if you only return to your breath or to return to the one thing that you were thinking about fully and wholly, well, then that's, that's, that's a victory, even if you only do it once. And then you get better and better and better at it. And the whole idea is that you're sharpening yourself to be able to hold focused intent on one thing for long periods of time. That, that's all it is. That literally is the definition, at least regarding me and my experience. So that's, that's another element where you can really start to go all in. You, you practice this idea of maybe returning to a focal point or... Um, you, you can do movement meditation, you can do eyes open, you can do walking, you can do what, whatever you want. I find the sport of jiu-jitsu quite meditative uh, because I'm having a sole focused point of attention within a training session, within a round that I am holding myself towards. And if I lose focus, I will remember it at the end of the round. I'll go, oh, okay, that, that was, it wasn't a waste, but it was a, a round that I did not spend focusing on the thing that I should have been focusing on. And then when you practice this outside of the sport, you actually start to get really good at it where you can change the dynamic of a round halfway through or a quarter of the way through, basically on command. And if you can get to a stage where you do that, well, then why can't you do that in competition? Why can't you accept that there's going to be a certain amount of noise around you? There's going to be a certain amount of emotions that are present, but you're going to focus on the sole focus that you have. So the the whole idea with this uh, misappropriation or this misobjectification of athletes to say that they don't feel fear or they don't feel nervous or they don't feel elation. They, they do feel all those things, but they are able to set themselves aside from that being the focal point. So I can exist here and be hungry without the necessity of going to get food. I, I'm allowed to experience this feeling as it comes over me, but not allow it to consume me. And that's that's the real the separating thing. And then I think this goes back to the, the origination of the conversation is where you you start to go all in on whatever it is that, that you're aiming to achieve. And you get to this really beautiful state where it's not the only thing that exists, but it's the primary focus. And then things can come and go. Doubts, fears, insecurities, wins. Because this happens on the opposite side of things too. People start to win, people start to make money, people start to get achievements and accolades and social validation. And even in a martial arts perspective, there's people who are winning tournaments, training 10 days a week or 10 times a week. And then they win, they win a couple and they get some validation, they get some um, 
social adoration from the peers around them and some confirmation that they're headed in the right direction because they're beating other people. And then they go, I can train nine times a week now. And then they just slowly chip away. And what they don't recognize is that it won't be obvious in the immediate future. And it's a compounding interest effect. So that if you add a session, it'll be a compounded effect over a long period of time. And if you take away a session, it'll be a compounding effect over a long period of time. Yep. The stratospheric difference between the person who commits fully and the person who doesn't is undeniable. There's such a large separating factor. I was explaining this to someone yesterday. The, the difference between average and good or average and above average is somewhere in the neighborhood of 20 hours of focused attention. If you podcasted for 20 hours, you'd be above average. If you posted 20 episodes, you'd be above average. If you studied for 20 hours in the sport of jiu-jitsu, you went to 20 sessions that were an hour long, you'd be above average. Uh, it doesn't mean that you'll be good. doesn't mean you'll be great. doesn't mean anything else aside from that. You just be above average. And it's actually the easiest point in history to be above average at something. If you think back at like the, the medieval stages, there were people who were born that were blacksmiths. They were born to be blacksmiths. So by the time they're 18, they've been doing it for 10 years, eight years, whatever. Try and beat that guy with 20 hours of work. This is never going to happen. So the difference between someone who's average and above average is about 20 hours. And hold that in your mind as you listen to the rest of this. The person who is above average to good, probably, if I was to put a definitive figure on it, is in the range of 200 hours. The person from good to great might be about 2,000 hours on top of that. So 2,220. We're at 2,220. Then the difference between somebody who's great and somebody who's excellent is in the neighborhood of 20,000 hours. There's, there's such, such a difference in, in the comparison between all those levels. Like I can confidently say if somebody were to come and train with me, do my sessions, eat my food, sleep the sleep that I do, listen to the material that I listen to, in six months, I could turn them into a national champion in jiu-jitsu in Australia pretty confidently fucking say that um could i turn them into the level that i've gotten to absolutely not there, there's a certain there, there's a certain attainment that i'm reaching for that has a perverted quality about it it's, it's not normal it is mostly above expectations uh that that somebody would be willing to commit this many man hours towards one extremely weird homoerotic wrestling sport that's done on the ground in very minimal clothing um but even i was talking about this the other day to somebody it's the it's the it's the pursuit of self-expression that i'm most interested in and the reason that jiu-jitsu captivates me so much is because there's all these personal inflictions and your disposition that is embodied within the game that you ultimately create so that there are attacking players who are really aggressive that are mostly like that in their lives. They, they go getters, they go and do things and they charge forwards. And then there's people with the more solemn disposition where they're a little bit more reserved, a little bit more quiet, less eager to speak up. And you see that represented in the way that they attack techniques. So they use them or they don't use them. Do they take risks or they don't take risks? Are they very reserved or they're not very reserved? Uh, are they using the flying crazy shit or are they using the technical apparatus that's very granular in their details? Do they have a creative artistic mind or do they have a mathematical disposition where they're very analytical? They could describe each of the key core elements of what constitutes the physics of the move and then the, the bio, uh, the, not the biochemistry, the, the, the physics of the move and then the biomechanics of the move. Or are they very artistic in their representation where they say, it feels like this to me. They're very kinesthetically aware and proprioceptive. And there's stories about widely considered one of the best to ever do it, Mr. Marcelo Garcia. There's stories about him where apparently he is just the most kinesthetically developed individual that this guy had ever experienced. And he was saying that he used to take, take him surfing and 
uh, long boarding and other bits and pieces. It didn't matter what board you put this guy on, whether it was a skateboard, it had two wheels, four wheels, six wheels, whether it was a surfboard, whether it was a, a what do they call it, foiling board, which is like a mast out of the ocean with um, a board on top of it. They go, it doesn't matter what you put him on. He's like a monkey. He just literally like a mountain goat. He just has perfect awareness of his own body and he can just completely represent that in whatever he does. And they said also that rolling with him was fucked up because he was a master of the transitional phase. He wasn't somebody who was trying to stop movement. He would try and create as much movement and catch you in the ocean of which he had developed between positions. There's always a lot of nuance uh, between certain things. And I, I forget who the quote is attributed to, but they say that music is actually the space between the notes, not the notes themselves. And it's these people who can it's these people who can major in the minors. There's a certain amount of space between each position in jiu-jitsu where a lot of nuance is. And if I study most of my time there and start to develop systems around the exchanges, like mo most people when they get into the sport, they're about a year or two in and they start to recognize that there's only a set amount of moves. Like somebody who's brand new will go, oh my God, I'm completely overloaded. I had no idea there was so much to this. But really when you think about it, there's upper body joint locks, there's lower body joint locks, there's strangles, there's five or six key positions. Uh, and then there's getting to those positions. Getting to those positions constitutes probably 90% of the sport, whereas the others is the 10%. So really it's this demonstration of figuring out what the pieces on the chessboard actually are and then how to use them. There's so many different creative ways. I think, I don't remember what the actual number is, but uh, I think there's more possible moves in chess across a game than there is like stars that we can see or something closely assimilated to that. Don't, don't directly quote me on that. Um, but th this starts to lay the land between, between good great and then excellent like really 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 at the pinnacle and this level of chase this level of pursuit is in my opinion the, the fucking sole thing that we're here for uh I, I don't know what else would captivate you as much than riding the roller coaster of chasing absolute fucking excellence and really being all in on something because if you're half in, half out, you're always going to have a fucking baked in excuse. Well, you know, I didn't try that hard and it wasn't that important and I didn't really want it. And there's, there's always these excuses that are available and most people take them. Most people, the average person, does not even have 20 hours marching in forwards in one skill. They don't. They, they work at an accounting firm or something. I, I don't know what the fuck they do. Maybe they're a barista. Maybe they can make coffee. Uh and they're above average in that skill because they've done it for more than 20 hours. But the, the thing that they want to do, the thing they want to create, the thing they want to build, the thing they want to produce, the thing they would really, really, really like to be chasing if, let's say, for example, that money didn't exist. And I've used this Alan Watts quote a fair bit, but I think it's worthwhile driving the point home. What else is worth it? Why would you be wanting to do anything else aside from chasing the thing that you deemed the most important. And it doesn't have to be anything spectacular. It doesn't have to be anything like conquer the world like everybody else thinks. It doesn't have to be this, oh, well, you know, um, who's the Roman guy? Was it Julius Caesar? Maybe it wasn't Caesar. One of the, one of the guys in the Roman times conquered the known world, uh, essentially, and he was like 21. It doesn't have to be these untold, ridiculous stories. It could be being the best dad that you know that you could be and just fully committing to that. I was reading something during the week and uh, a guy that was writing this passage, the author of the passage, he was saying that he's done all these fantastic and wonderful things and he's become world-class in a couple of different subjects because he really studies the way how to learn things, uh, the way that he specifically learns things. And he said, uh, being a dad is by far and away the most important achievement of his entire existence, by far. And he's done world-class things at a couple of different activities. And he said, um, 
the ability to gauge their learning process through just being around them and watching them and how they basically make the world mean what it means to them. He goes, it's utterly captivating. He goes, there's never been anything more exciting for me than watching them process all this shit that's going on around them without labels and just having that very unique beginner's mind that I think a lot of us lose out on. And it's like that childlike wonderment I was speaking about a couple of weeks ago. If you could just have the beginner's principle, the beginner's mind and, and anticipate that it would be challenging but fun without preconceived notions and ideas and cognitive biases. Like most people's cognitive bias based on the scholastic system that business is extremely difficult. It is difficult, but it's no more difficult than going to a job every day. It really isn't. It, it, it really isn't. And at some levels, yes, you will be tested in your capacities. But you'll be tested in your capacities in other ways at work, like dealing with fucking Karen at the water cooler. I couldn't think of anything worse. I would rather deal with 1,500 customers every single fucking day than hear what Karen has to say about maths. I really would. That would be more challenging to me than dealing with the, the amount of customers that you would have to deal with in any given day. Um, people, people think that uh, like negative reviews are difficult. Imagine being locked in a cubicle on a fucking commute that was 90 minutes each way. It was soul-sucking deprivation where they told you exactly what to wear and you weren't allowed to speak up and talk about your opinions. It's infinitely more difficult. So it's, it's, it's how you frame it is what I'm getting at. And if you have a, a true and honest beginner's mind, well, then you look at it through the lens of a child. They don't have frames. We we're, were talking about this before we started recording the episode, but... Kids don't know that the rain will make you sick until you tell them it'll make them sick, which is a preconceived idea and a cognitive bias that is mostly unfounded in facts because your nan told you that your mum told you and then you told your daughter or son or whatever else. And I've been in the rain a fuckload of times and never gotten sick. So, you know, it's just this preconceived idea and the, the people that get a little sniffle and oh, I was in the rain, that's why I got sick. Was it? Oh, you're hanging around with grotty kids all day. I, I don't know. Were well, you eating shit food? Were you having a shit diet? Who knows? There's a multitude of things. It's, it's the exact same thing as like everybody gets sick in winter. Yeah, because you fucking tell yourself you get sick in winter, you melon. Um, what if you told yourself you'd never got sick in winter? You should never get sick in winter. Maybe. Maybe I'm talking out of my ass. But I don't get sick very often. Like my missus comes home with colds all the time. She goes, fuck you. You never get sick. I'm like, yeah, because I tell myself I never get sick. Um, it, it, it's also the way that you manipulate your reality around you to say that I will do what is necessary, not I will do what I feel like doing. And um, funnily enough, we're going down the 37 minute intro again, but this has been a nice little flow. There's a quote that I've got here. Follow your plan, not your mood. Um, in in the, the grand scheme of the theme of everything that's going on here in this conversation about people really not going all in, they do the inverse of this. They they follow their moods, not their plans. So, you know, I, well, I, I would like to run a business and I would like to be successful. I'd like to make a hundred grand a month and I would like to drive a Ferrari. That's the plan. But I am pretty hungry, so I'm going to get lunch first and then I'll do. Then I'll do it. Then I'll I'll fall and trip and fumble my way into ridiculous success. Or I feel horny, so I'm going to go fucking jack off first. Bad idea. Don't do it. It's a fucking horrible idea. I used to be one of these people, so I know exactly what it's like. I, I used to do this thing where I was working for a, um, a personal training company that was a business mentorship, and I would wait till I struck up this internal motivation to jump on the phone and call people and try and sell this program to them that... I didn't ultimately believe because I wasn't putting in the effort to get the results. So it was really bad mismanagement of getting me to sell the program because I had no fundamental faith in it because I wasn't receiving the rewards. But it was only a contextual specific bias that I had because I was refusing to put in the work that was necessary, necessitative of actually delivering the result. So that you see how these rosy colored glasses that you wear I thought that it didn't work because I wasn't doing the work and I was unwilling to call myself out on the fact that I was being a victim as it results to this mythical program doing all the work for me. Fucking newsflash. No program can do anything for you unless you physically apply it. Again, I used to go through this shit 
all the time with personal training clients and personal training is a really funny and interesting and fucked up industry because you do all the work and then they blame you for doing nothing <laughs> because they couldn't stop pumping fucking Tim Tams into their face. You're like, Karen, I have supreme authority to say that this diet will get you to lose weight based on thermodynamics, which is a law, which means that your body burns a certain amount of calories based on its eating habits that you will either A, be in a surplus or B, be in a deficit. And I've structured it in a way for you to be in a deficit. So why are you gaining weight? <laughs> and they're like, your plan doesn't work. And you're like, for fuck's sake. Then you actually get into it with them and you start to play a game with them. You're like, okay, so you followed the diet perfectly. And they're like, I didn't follow it perfectly. Okay, what's your definition of not perfect? And they go, well, I had some chocolate on Monday night. And you're like, is that it? And they're like, no and then you slowly get it out of them and then you get into this weird phase where the whole session that you're meant to be training is actually teasing out of them what they fucking ate during the week so you're not getting the exercise to promote the calorie deficit and then you're also just like kind of like just getting them to fucking follow along for like 45 minutes really annoying i had this one client really great guy and um he saw me deadlifting next to him or no he was deadlifting and i was bench pressing and I was benching more than he was deadlifting. And he looked at me with like utter disgust. And he was like, how the fuck are you doing that? And I was like, do you want me to teach you how to? And he's like, yeah, I'd love that. And then he became one of my best clients ever. And um, I actually wonder what he's doing sometimes. He used to drive a, a, an M3 and a Mustang. And um, I've seen similar versions of those, like not your gay new Mustang. They, they fucking suck. They just rebranded Toyotas but like a 1967 Mustang, like in the in a really nice um, light gray metallic silver color. It's fucking awesome, beautiful car. Um, not too dissimilar from the Gone in 60 Seconds one, which is probably the one. Like that's, that's a fucking immaculate car. And um, we're talking about his diet and he goes, oh, well, you know, I snack. And I'm like, okay, what do your snacks look like? And he goes... Uh, I get these chocolate coated almonds that, that are meant to be pretty healthy. And I'm like, healthy, huh, interesting. So we looked at the bag and we looked at the calories. And then I said, how many of these do you eat a week? How many bags? And he goes, two bags a week. So we did the numbers. And two bags of these almonds a week was, I think it was like 27 punnets of strawberries or three full boxes of Cocoa Pops. And he was just like absolutely befuddled that that, was representative of these almonds that he thought was healthy. And um, that was just a cognitive bias that he had, that it was like, oh, it was, you know, it's, it's meant to be healthy, so I'll just eat as fucking many of them. But that, that was him underneath the pre-context that he was doing the right thing. And, and most people get to this stage when they're trying to endeavor to do something great. They, they, they think that they're making some sort of an excuse is the right thing to do. Maybe they've always been around it or maybe they've just decided that that's what they want to do. And that's exactly what I was doing when I was doing the personal training stuff with the, the sales calls. I was just making excuses. And my life didn't get any better until I fully decided to go, no, I'm going to commit to this actually properly, physically, mentally, spiritually, all the rest. And I'm not going to allow my naivety to be the reason I don't get there. I'm going to search and scrounge and look for all the details and really focus and, and really take a take a keen interest. And I'm, and I'm not going to follow my mood or whether I think I want to do something or whether I feel like doing it or whether I'm motivated to do it. Goggins has this really funny point about that. He goes, I wake up in the morning and sometimes I look at those fucking shoes for 30 minutes before I put them on. And he goes, you think I want to run? I don't want to fucking run. Running's the thing I hate the most. And that's why I do it to myself every day. It's this quite weird masochistic thing. But uh, in some elements, I agree. Sometimes you got to do shit you fucking hate. Sometimes you got to do things you don't want to do. Sometimes you got to do things that are very inconvenient. Sometimes you got to do things that take mental strain and detract from other areas of your life like the the greatness example that i laid out beforehand with the 20 the 200 the 2000 the 20,000 hours some days i wake up and i go i fucking love the sport of jiu-jitsu it's the best i can't wait to do it some days i wake up i'm like i fuck i just don't care about ground karate today all that much 
these moments are extremely fleeting and I'm I'm very fortuitous in this, this aspect. And I think the only reason I have such a vivid passion for this sport is like I described earlier, is that I really truly see it as the self-expression or the fulfillment of pure self-expression physically. Uh, and secondarily to that, it's that I also had a previous professional athletic career where I didn't make that connection and that ultimately dwindled as a result of that. So these moments are extremely far and few between. I, I think I've probably had, truth be told, I probably had maybe three or four sessions in my whole career where I was like, I can't be fucked going to training. And I've had many more sessions than that where I've just abandoned the game plan and just gone in and trained. Specifically the start of my career, uh, where that was literally all I knew. I didn't know what a game plan was. And I can think of times around like um, breakups and, and shit that's gone wrong and other bits and pieces uh, where I didn't really fully commit to the session. I kind of just showed face. Uh, but that's the underwhelming minority where for a lot of people, that's actually the majority of their sessions where they kind of just plod along and, and you see it. I'm not going to name any people, obviously. I'm not going to call people out, but you see the people that don't make stark progress in their training and there's not a lot of creativity that's fostered and there's not a lot of conscious intent built a day after day after day after day and the whole idea is if you want to get really fucking good at something specifically a sport or even at business or conversation or anything like that i have um, mates of mine that i have conversations around this and the parallels are actually uncanny if you want to get phenomenal at something you have to put in so much conscious work that it then starts to formulate itself into an unconscious act. Because if we try and problem solve something at an extremely high level consciously without intuition and any of the unconscious um, behaviors running in the background, we're going to be a really poor version of a computer. And this is where people are saying like AI is going to take over. And like, yeah, of course, for the very mathematical problems, they're going to be way better at us than and taking data and pools of data and collecting them into information uh, that's usable. But where we have a definitive and stark advantage actually is on the intuitive side of things, the unconscious, where we're not exactly aware of this going on. And it just comes to light. There's a, there's a certain amount of inspiration that comes out of nowhere. This is most easily represented in when you are thinking about someone, um, just happen, it's happenstance, and then they ring you or they send you a text. This is this whole phenomenon of like the unknown side of things. And this mountainous work of conscious intent that goes in starts to allow you to unconsciously move within these moves. So... When I'm rolling, when I'm training, I'm not actually thinking I'll put my hand here so that I can elicit step one, two, and three of a specific move. It's more of a unconscious understanding that if that goes there, this goes there. And it, it's very fluid. It's very movement-based. It's very intuitive. Uh, and you get some people that are quite poor at articulating this. We've got a couple of training partners that are not the best at explaining things, but they are fucking unbelievable athletes their kinesthetic awareness is off the charts and they just have this way with movement where they can't describe to you what they're doing but it feels correct that's sort of this of what i'm describing and that only comes as a result of unbelievable mountains of conscious intent that goes into it only so that you could free yourself from that by permeating it into the unconscious and that you now have complete creativity and upward mobility throughout that method and this is where real true excellence gets to shine. Like Tiger Woods is not thinking about his form when he hits a, a golf ball. He's, he's really not. And Roger Federer or Nadal or uh, Jokic, or, any, or, or is it Djokovic? Yeah, it's Djokovic. Jokic is the basketball player. These guys aren't thinking, well, if I turn my racket ever so slightly upwards and if I manipulate the curve angle and all this sort of shit, or like, how hard am I going to hit this serve? No, they know that a fast serve feels a certain type of way. They know that a forehand feels a specific type of way. They have this conscious navigation system for what correct movement feels like. 
And then they, they are able to express that through the multiple thousands of hours throughout their conscious intent of working and tinkering and playing with different things. And you start to get into this rhythm when you really get with it, you really commit, you really go all in where you have rounds that are like governed by conscious intent, but then the things just start magically happening where let's say we're doing stand up rounds, we're doing a little bit of wrestling and hand fighting, but you just, your body just knows how to place itself. It just moves within a specific set of sequences and then they end up on the floor and you're on top of them. It's very, it's, it's really, really cool. And the, the difference between greatness and excellence is the deconstruction of that to continually manufacture those um, those experiences so that you have a whole fleet of those. But then you actually know how they work and you know how you're finding them. And if you know how you find them, well, then you're going to find a fuckload more of them. And it's this consciousness and this single pointed focus, this charge toward excellence that really starts to nail these things down. And once you... You're, you're essentially finding the golden goose. You're not finding a golden egg because the golden egg is cool, but you only get one of them. You're finding the golden goose that continually lays these eggs all the fucking time. And the people who are very, 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 very top of their fields, they found a way to just continually chase down this path. And it's an asymptote because you're never going to be perfect, but you're always approximating it. You're getting closer and closer and closer. And then you pick up a new toy and you play with that, even with, within the specific task that you're going for or in another area that completely captivates you. I had this with um, league and then finishing that and then going into powerlifting and powerlifting kind of didn't really scratch that itch. And then jujitsu came along and then I was like, oh, well, I'm fucking pretty balls deep into this now. I'm going to just keep doing this. And uh, along that way, business has been a concurrent theme as well where I'm starting to think about that and like things that can be done better, faster, more improved, more efficiency with less time and you're never going to get it perfect, but you can always approximate it. And, and that's the journey that you start to go on. And notice how this is, a, in some ways, an explanation of how to play infinite games because you're always searching for the next best way to do things. You're always searching for the next iteration of how you can do it. And you're always focused on the fulfillment of making it better in some way, shape or form. So that you don't get to a stage where you get trapped. Let's say your goal is to earn $10,000 a month, for instance, is pretty common. So that you don't get trapped in setting that goal, fulfilling it, doing the work, achieving the result, and then falling off the back end. So that you hit it for one and then you fell off. Or that you win a couple of tournaments and then you fall off. Because that's the limitation with non unlimited games you will always be projecting onto an outcome and believe me i know some people who are unbelievably good at their field whether that be in business or in sport or in art or anything like that uh and, and they never said i want to make five artworks they, they never said that or they, they never said i want to make 10 million dollars it just never happened it was always born from something that was an infinite game and originally, yeah, sure, when you're, when you're first at that beginning stage, you're like, you know what? It would be really good to just not have to worry about how much fucking groceries are going to be this week. That'd be really nice. It'd be really nice to go to the petrol pump and just fill the cunt up and just not have to worry about what the sign says. It would be really nice. It'd be really nice. This was a, an original one for me. I went to a dinner and uh, this, this guy paid for everybody and it was really expensive, so $1,800 for dinner. And that absolutely fucking blew my mind that he didn't give less of a fuck about almost two grand on dinner. It went crazy. Uh, and, and the original generation of me really diving deep into business was that I could give that opportunity and that experience to my family. So like I could ring my dad and be like, hey dad, do you want to go get the most unbelievable steak of your entire life? And just not look at the price of the menu and not look at the bill and not give a single fuck. That was the original... Uh, version of me moving towards what I'm doing now. And I uh, had that for my birthday. It was cool. I, I kind of got fucking ripped off because I spent a lot of money on dinner. <laughs> it was my birthday. But um, that's that's the reason you do these things. And, and, and uh, Tristan Tate talks about this as well. He goes, people who say money can't buy happiness are fucking idiots because they're just looking at it the wrong way. Like, yeah, maybe buying a Lamborghini doesn't make you happy for a long period of time. But telling your family they can come to dinner and not have to worry, don't bring your wallets. 
that's fucking cool. It's a cool experience. It's nice. Telling your mum and dad they don't have to work. That's fucking nice. It's cool. Telling your missus that you've got it. You've got it covered. Like you're going to fucking buy the house and then she doesn't have to worry about work. You want to work? Cool, work. If you don't want to, don't fucking work. Raise the kids. Be a traditional mother. Great. Um, that shit's cool. So yeah, fuck, it does buy happiness because it enables you the opportunity to be able to do things like that. And that is so fucking important. But that only comes from these infinite games. And if you can hone your perspective to play an infinite game and actually really go all in, like not fucking, not pretend to be all in, not not on the surface, not, not so that everybody looks at you going, yeah, that guy's all in, or not that you appear that way, or not that you... Uh, presented that way on social media because everybody's going to find out we're talking before about liars and the problem with liars is it's very energetically dense to continue lying because you always have to remember what you said which draws you into your past which means you're going to fucking stay there and self fulfills the lying um, cycle where it's perpetuated far into the future so that everything both forwards of uh, both backwards from where you are and forwards of where you are is all fucking fugazi bullshit it's a very dangerous place to be you should always fucking tell the truth no matter what because you never have to worry about what you said you just be authentic you just be like here it is you like it you like it you don't you don't i get people comment on social media all the time they fucking disagree with whatever i've said or they uh they think that i'm a fucking bad person for holding an opinion that's opposite to theirs and i always reply like well, I reply a couple of different things like estrogen detected, opinion rejected is one of the funny ones. But um, they like just pull their point out of their ass and then they throw it on the internet. And I'm like, well, if you don't like it, don't watch it. Just keep scrolling. No one's fucking forcing you to watch this. Um, it's very strange to me that people would actively pursue looking at things that they don't like. Un unless you genuinely want to start discourse with somebody about why they think the way that they think, which is not at all the perspective that these people are taking. Um, People on the internet that comment about things that they hate are very troubled individuals. Um, we need to take the internet off them. But um, really going all in, really playing these infinite games, really putting yourself in the best light and, and allowing yourself to think about the opportunities you can afford yourself as a result of doing these things. Putting all that together, thinking about what that would feel like if you're not at that position, thinking about what that would feel like and then reverse engineering a daily structure that would perfectly match the encapsulation of how you would feel had you already done it. And you listen to, I, I'm remiss to say like the law of attraction because so much bullshit is on this around the internet. It's very easy to get distracted on a multitude of levels. But you listen to somebody like Conor McGregor and there's no arguments to say that he is a person who perfectly embodied the practice of seeing it before it became real and he was talking about this all the time and i used to do this i still do it today where you're driving in the car that's the beat up piece of shit fucking honda jazz or whatever it is and you like you feel the steering wheel you're like this is the ferrari steering wheel and you think about it you're like you're taking corners and people think you're a fucking retard probably but um i i used to take corners in the corolla as if i was driving the mercedes that i drive now and I thought about it. And every time I saw one on the road, I'd be mean, like, yeah, that's like the same car that I have in the garage. You just, you create this likeliness to it. You create this uh, affiliation with it that there's no barrier. There's no border. There's no, oh, you know, that Ferrari looks really cool. Wish I had one of them. If you're in that camp, you're always going to be in that camp. You're never going to fucking leave. But if you go, and this might sound delusional or crazy, but works just go cool same one i got and you don't have to tell anyone you don't have to fucking brag about it you don't have to say that out loud you really don't you just cool same one i've got and you drive and you, you feel like you're in the car that you want to be in and you're like i did this thing where i used to watch videos of the exhaust noise of my car that i drive today and every time i get in it i push the little button i fucking hear the noise it's great it's fantastic it puts a smile on my face all the time uh, and I watched TikTok videos before I went to bed of this fucking car, the the noise. And I was just thinking about it. I'm like, that's cool. This is the same one in the garage. And I just kept repeating it to myself until it fucking came true. Don't don't get me wrong. I didn't only do that. I worked extremely hard. And I had a fucking single pointed focus that enabled me to give that opportunity to myself. Um, 
but having the imaginative quality to think about what it would be like had you already done it, I think is very important. It's a very nice contextual frame that allows you to be where you are at, not be ahead of where you're at, not be behind of where you're at. There's no distance. There's no gap between that experience viscerally and that experience mentally. And and if you really go down into the subject matter of studying visualization and somatic sensory experiences and uh, even people who have had experience with uh, this is a, a section of the book by um, Maxwell Maltz called Psycho, Psycho-Cybernetics. And I talk about this in my course. The viscerally important practice of visualization actually holds as much credit to the nervous system of the body as physical activity does. So there were three subject groups. One group shot no basketballs. They did nothing. They did no mental activity whatsoever. The second group, actually shot free throws of basketballs and they got 23% better, I believe was the thing. And the people who just visualized at the very end of them shooting shots, they actually got 24% better when they all tested each other. And that goes to serve the absolutely untapped potential of the mind and, and your ability to focus that in on one specific key area of your life. Like if you could continually remind yourself of how it feels to be at X revenue, at X family, at X job, at X sporting achievement, blah, 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 blah. You can actually bring it towards you because it feels so familiar. You won't be having this. There's, there's a there's a concept in high level competition in terms of cognitive biases where you have to be very willing to be dynamic, not static. And this happens all the time. You see it in uh a rugby league game, for instance, where a team will gain a lead and then they will become less dynamic. They will become static towards the holding of the lead rather than the fulfillment of gaining more ground. And you saw it in last year's grand final where uh, the team who was winning by a significant margin ended up losing because they were static in their approach. They were actually negating otherwise purposeful opportunities for the uh, the improvement of that lead so that the visual, uh, the, the, the mental compass that they were using was only pointing in a very, very small window of opportunity, which ended up being their actual demise. So that people will do this all the time. They'll always have this preconceived notion, this preconceived idea that it's, it's going to be one way. And then they would deny themselves the opportunity to have it be any other way. They, they will automatically say, well, that, that, that will never happen for me or I could never achieve that or that, that's not available to me or anything of the sort. But if you reverse engineer that and chop and change it and have the preconceived notion and the preconceived visual apparatus that you, you've been there, you've been there again and again and again and again, then you use science to back up your claims, including what Maxwell Maltz was speaking about, that if you live it mentally and visually, it actually legitimately courses through your nervous system to make physiological changes akin to that experience of you falling in a dream and then waking up in a sweat you continually act on that every single day and then you then you use that in whatever we call this fucking reality but that that that, that's the context of how you're acting i don't see any other way that you that you achieve anything that isn't exactly that. It becomes so familiar to you. It becomes so understood by your body that you start to seek out these opportunities in the context of this achievement having already been fulfilled. And then you just march in that direction. And then eventually you fucking get there because you do away with time. You you do away with lack and scarcity and uh, doubt and fear and insecurity because you're living it every day through your fucking head. And if you just continually do that, you're not going to feel these negative biased feelings because you live it every day. And yeah, your outside world is going to look pretty fucking different. But to use Conor McGregor as an example again, he used to be in the shittest town in Ireland with the shittest people hanging around envisaging that it would be double time fucking world champion with more money than he knew what to do with, a fucking car for every day of the week a big fucking house and his mum could retire, his dad could retire and all that sort of stuff. If he can fucking do it, why can't you? There's a certain level of delusion, but there's a certain level of commitment 
to living the reality that you want to and and not taking no for an answer i i don't i'm not where i want to be uh currently as it results to here i've got a lot of things on my plate and a lot of things that i'm working on bringing into fruition that i live up here a lot and i don't come from much at all it's just some fucking little smart ass kind on tiktok was like oh your parents are rich that's why you can train and it's not even couldn't be further from the truth it's actually quite hilarious um and i know a lot of people that come from very similar backgrounds as i do and have continued to just succeed in spite of those things i've seen people in my own personal circle become phenomenal influencers from the shittest of upbringings they actually become a node of influence of motivation for people around them in their own personal circle having gone through the worst atrocities and that has varying degrees of, of of separation but to be able to still maintain that conviction with all that fucking shit going on around you and still come through the back end i think that's i, I think that's worth respect first of all but it's worth admiration only so that you can apply it to your own life how, how powerful is it to think and we'll finish up on this but how powerful it is to think that no matter what your circumstances are in your current day and age with your your health, your wealth, your finances, no matter what those circumstances portray to you right at this moment, that you could fucking make it whatever you want in spite of them, regardless of them. It doesn't fucking matter where you are. It's where you end up. It's, it's what journey you commit yourself to every single day, day in, day out, day in, day out. Like your your ability to almost be reckless in a sense with taking this version of reality as important whatsoever, where you could be the guy that's at a job that's paying him fucking 20 bucks an hour, barely, barely getting by with the vision inside their head that they're producing millions of products per year so that people could have a better life. Uh, only to find out a decade and a half later you're doing it. Why not? Why not you? Why why not have that ability to be able to have that vision inside your own head? It, it, like people people look at movies all the fucking time. Every weekend, probably someone watches one movie, two movies, three movies, spends all this time on Netflix. How do you think that movie came to existence? How do you think it manifested materially? Some cunt sat down, had a vision in his head, and worked on it every single fucking day until it became this thing that was presentable where they took it to a, a studio and the studio goes, yep, we like it, no worries. Where he was, had enough money and enough uh, funding to produce it and worked on it every single day, 12 to 18 hour days for a couple of months until it went into production and the editing phase and all of that. And he oversaw all of that, directed it, got all the actors and all the right faces, all the right people and had these visions of who they wanted in the movie and who would perfectly encapsulate the role and put it all together. And then some, maybe five years later, it exists. What's the difference between that and your life where you get the job that you want, you get the car that you want, you get the girl that you want, you get the fucking day-to-day -day existence that you don't fucking hate. I don't think there is a difference. And I know there isn't a fucking difference because I've been there. I used to wake up and fucking hate getting up. I used to hit snooze three times. I used to not be able to string together a half legible sentence. I used to be so terrified of speaking when I was a kid that I would like have fits because I was fucking so shy. I didn't want to speak up about anything. And now in some aspects, I speak for a living. Who the fuck could have seen that coming? Except this big cranium. Um, consider it Con consider it that it doesn't matter where you start it doesn't matter what the fuck you have available to you there, there are literally guys who are motivational speakers that I've listened to that were broke as fuck sleeping at their job and now they're multi-millionaires from speaking that's it and Steve Harvey is a good example Steve Harvey is self-quoted as being illiterate he can't read he can't write and yet he's a fucking TV show host 
for like seven or eight different shows, multi-hundred millionaire for speaking, for a skill that he does not have. <laughs> like part of being good at speaking, at least in some part, in my opinion, would be reading and writing. But he goes, nah, fuck that. Just do it anyway. And now he's worth untold fortune. It's crazy. When you think about stories like that often enough, then you finally get the rub. You finally get the communication to yourself that you like. Okay, if that guy, Steve Harvey, one of the most famous people on earth, can do that with that limited version of skills, why can't I be a better uh, worker, manager, business owner, family, man, fucking, I don't, I don't know, whatever, you, whatever you're into, whatever the cut of your jib is. Um, the, the whole point is, is that you are the only one telling yourself it can't happen. And maybe some other fuckwits that you literally shouldn't be listening to anyway. The amount of fucking messages that I've had or like comments or whatever, else, oh, you, you fucking suck, blah, blah, blah. Right, I can't. But in five years, you're going to be in the same place and I'm going to be in a completely different place. So, you know, if, if you listen to those people and you allow them to obstruct you, then, you know, you, you probably deserve not getting where you need to be because at some stage, you just got to tell people to fuck off and not be pertaining to the mood, but pertaining to the plan. The plan is this thing. And if you can maintain conviction on it, you're golden. You just go back to the Steve Harvey example. Steve Harvey was... Um, dating this chick and she dared him to go to a comedy festival to go and try out he'd never done it before never had no idea what it was and he goes all right fuck it went there killed 150 bucks monday morning quit his job <laughs> he won 50 dollars was nowhere near enough to pay for everything that he needed to pay for had a kid and a wife and just went i'm going all in on this thing i did once and it was just this intuitive sense that he knew that he had to do it. And lived in his car for three years. Who would be really willing to do that, listening to this? Really willing to do that. And just went for it. And now, again, like I said, multi-fucking hundred millionaire, nine figures, whatever. Um, it's, it's pretty cool. It's pretty fucking cool. And think about that story of some some sort of level in your own life that one day you'd be able to tell your kids like, yeah, that's what I did. I went for it when I shouldn't have. Uh, I, I didn't really have the, the, like the support network or the backing or the, the funds, whatever the fuck that means anyway. Um, more businesses than you know have been started with fuck all money. And as soon as you get that leverage point you're like oh well i could just do it and then you just do it and then maybe that one's not for you but then you just go again and then maybe that one's not for you and it's likely that the first five to ten will fucking suck but you get better and you've got the right context and you know what it's going to feel like when it is right so you just keep perpetuating that in your own head and you deny everything else that fucking disagrees with it because fuck all those people and all those thoughts even your own inner dialogue will say it and then eventually you end up exactly where you're meant to be, which is the focal point, the continuation of the focus that you've been perpetuating throughout this whole thing. And there's no need to even get really esoteric with it. It's just you're focused on a thing. That's all you're sought after. You continually move toward it. You convinced yourself that you had it and you fucking went for it. And then you got it. And that it would never actually be a place that you end up, more a journey that you take and a pathway that you follow but that that pathway would bring you infinite amounts of fulfillment as a result of being on a path and chasing a specific thing and that that thing can change. But you'll never know until you fucking go all in. So just do it. I mean, Nike come up with the best fucking slogan of all time. Just do it. Um, but yeah, I said we'd end on this and then I went for another eight minutes, but you know. It is what it fucking is. Get over it. If you don't like it, don't watch it. But if you do watch it and you do gain something from it, I'd be happy to hear from you. Um, shoot me a DM on Instagram. Comment down below. Like this. Share it with a mate. I had a, uh, a mate of mine who I used to train at the gym with in Blacktown send me one of my older episodes. And um, I'll pull it up so I don't butcher uh, what he's saying. Shout out to um, Anthony, by the way. 
He goes, it has to be my most re-listened to episode. This episode really stimulates my brain. He said, um, and the few after resonant heaps, he's butchered this sentence, but uh, it has felt like I've been in the trenches for the last nine years in business and now I'm finally winning. And I'm like, fuck yeah, that's pretty cool. And I, I don't pretend to be like a, a reason for that whatsoever. He's off living his own life, doing his own things, per, uh, perpetuating that. But it's nice to know that vibrations from my face hole have made him think a little bit differently to allow him to uh, use it or change his perspective and, and go on to do great things. So um, yeah, if you, if you like the episodes and if you feel like that is you, I'd be more than happy to hear the story. Uh, if you feel like you want to share that with somebody else, do so. If you don't want to share it with anyone else, you thought this is the worst thing you've ever listened to, then all right. Bye. <laughs>